This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Jeremiah talks a lot about boasting in our text for today. Uh, and we are going to be in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. So if you guys have your Bibles or your devices, whatever you use to get into the Word, go ahead and get those things out, because this is where we're going to be today. We all boast in different things all the time, whether it's how many victory royals you got the, the other night in Fortnite, or how much more you know about coffee than everyone else on campus, <laughs> or even that the city that you came from is so much bigger than Joplin or even has mountains. You know what I'm saying? For me, there's one thing, if there's one thing I'm going to brag about, it certainly isn't that I'm from Washington State or that I only drink fresh drip pour over coffee. For me, it's got to be my hair. Now, I know everyone in this room thinks that it looks so great right now, and I would agree with every single one of you, but there was a time when it was even better than this. I have a picture that I want to show you guys. This picture is from my freshman year of high school. It was my ID card. I want you to all bask in it. Bask in the greatness of the prime of my hair. And my hair in this picture got me affectionately called Frogan. So I'll let you all bask in that. But why does, Jeremiah, why does Jeremiah consider boasting such a problem? A lot of these things seem pretty harmless, but in reality, they reflect what is going on in your heart, what's going on in my heart. It can reveal idols forming in your life. The things you boast in are often the things that you worship. I want to ask you today, where is your worship where is your worship? I want this to be our guiding question as we unpack these couple of verses today. In 923, it says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. There's a word that shows up in the, in the text a handful of times that I think we ought to take a look at. It is this word boast. Now, I'm about to get all nerdy on you guys, so please bear with me. This word boast comes from the Hebrew word halal, which is the word for praise. So it originally doesn't mean boasting, but it has its roots in the idea of praising something. Nidot says that it is an expression of appreciation and a response to good qualities. This word most commonly shows up in the book of Psalms, which is affectionately referred to as the hymn book of the Bible, I think for good reason. Psalm 18.3 says, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Psalm 56.10 and 11 says, In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not afraid, what can man do to me? Psalm 96.4 says, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. And Psalm 117 says, praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Looking back at the nation of Israel, they were chosen for God's glory and for his praise. And to reflect his praiseworthiness in the world. That was their original purpose. And Jeremiah Israel is in the midst of some very major issues. Jeremiah was starting to be written during the time of King Josiah, who, while on the throne, brought huge religious reform to the nation of Judah. He tore down idols and shrines all around the nation. He cleansed the temple. And he made the law of God known amongst the people again. But unfortunately, all of that died with him. When he died, the people went back to worshiping idols and turned away from God once more. Jeremiah is warning the people of the fate of such idolaters and of those whose praise and affections are for things that are not God. 
Earlier in the chapter in verse 3, he says, They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another, and they do not acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Halal, this word for praise in the Hebrew is in the hip pile form, getting nerdy on you again, in uh, Jeremiah 20, 9, 23, and 24. This means that it is reflexive and that the subject is also the object. To give you another example of this, let's look at a phrase. Nations praise Yahweh. Nations is the subject, uh, praise is the verb, and Yahweh is the object. But in the hip pile, that subject becomes the object. So in the hip pile, it would be nations praise themselves. And the nations being the subject, praise being the verb, and themselves now being the object. In 923, Jeremiah gives three things that are common among the praise of people. Wisdom, strength, and riches. These are all things that people are able to obtain for themselves by their own effort and by their own work. I mean, you can work really hard to gain understanding, gain wisdom, gain intellect by reading a lot of books, sitting in class, learning as much as you can. You can have the best workout plan and the best diet plan and become physically strong, become physically mighty. You can hang out with the right crowd of people to gain influence and to be powerful in that way. Or you can go to school to get a degree in a career that will put you in some corporation. You'll climb the corporate ladder, end up making six figures, seven figures, eight figures for your salary, and get a lot of money from that. So in 923, in essence, I think God is saying, wise people, don't praise yourselves for your wisdom. Strong people, don't praise yourselves for your strength. Rich people, don't praise yourselves for your riches. All of these things, they're fleeting, they're temporary, and they could be taken away from us at any moment. I mean, think about Samson. He's set apart for God, given great strength, but because of his boasting, his strength was ultimately taken away from him. He was so consumed with himself that he ended up losing it all. Think about Solomon. This guy was supposedly the wisest guy to ever live. This dude was filthy rich. He had a thousand wives and concubines. He had a whole kingdom that he was over. The man had it all, but by the end of his life, he called everything vanity. He called all of that vanity, empty, meaningless. Solomon, at the end of Ecclesiastes, tells us what he thinks the point of life is. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, he says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And I think that's what Jeremiah is getting at in this text. See, in verse 24, he says, But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. God says that if you're going to boast in anything at all, at least boast in something that's worth boasting about, something that's worth praising. Praise him that you can know him and understand his ways. This word for understanding, sakal, has a wide range of meaning from being prudent and having success to having understanding and acting with insight or devotion. This shows up in another spot in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 3.15, he says, Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. God is going to give them shepherds with his knowledge and his understanding to lead, to guide the people in the way that they were always intended to. And through that, they will impart his knowledge and his understanding on them. The theological use of this word includes the giving of insight by God. So if you're going to put your praise anywhere, then put it in the God who gives us the understanding to be able to know him. I mean, not that you could really take any credit for that anyway, which I think might be the point here. You didn't cause God to give you any understanding, and you couldn't really know much or anything about him if he hadn't even caused it in the first place. And who is this God exactly? Why is he so praiseworthy? Well, I'm glad you asked. He is the Lord. He is Yahweh, the God who practices kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. 
These sorts of things are the things that he delights in. He's the God who so graciously has revealed himself to us, given us his righteous standard, practices justice according to his unfailing and absolutely perfect righteousness. This God, this God is to be worshipped and praised above all else on the earth because he is so worthy, you guys. Even though so many of the leaders of Israel failed to guide their people into the understanding of God and went after things that ultimately aren't God, God promised to send another shepherd for his flock. In Jeremiah 23, 5, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely, or with understanding that same word that was used in 315. And this king will do what is just and right in the land. This God has now given us the ability to know who he is even more. God came down to us as a man, the good shepherd, Jesus, who would take upon himself the sins of the world and resurrect to show his true love. And he would, he would take upon himself the sins of the world to show God's righteousness on the cross. God delights in these things, and Jesus embodied them fully. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And in John 14, 9, Jesus even says that anyone who has seen him has seen the Father. So, where is your worship? Where is your praise at? Is it in yourself? Is it in your accolades or is it in your talents? Is it in who you know or what you know? You see, the nations, they were supposed to praise Yahweh, but instead they ended up praising themselves. God was supposed to be the object of their praise, but Israel replaced him with idols and with their own deeds. We do this too, you guys. We put so many other things as the object of our praise. If you guys don't take anything else away from what I say today, I ask that you would hear this. The object of all our praise is to be God alone. The object of all our praise is to be God alone. You know, this is a pretty simple statement, but honestly, it can be pretty difficult to live out. For me, I know I can wake up in the morning with every intention of, even, of giving my full devotion and my full worship to God. But by the end of the day, I realize that so many other things end up taking his place. Some days I look back, I see that my grades were the object of my praise. I tend to be a perfectionist, and I want to do everything to the best of my ability. But sometimes that comes with me lying to boost my grade, or caring more about what my professors or my classmates think about my work, rather than how it helps me better worship God. Some days I look back and I can see that my reputation was the object of my praise. You know, I like people to think well of me, and I like to be liked. But when my reputation becomes more important than people seeing Christ in me, my praise is clearly more focused on people than on God. Other days my knowledge is the object of my praise, or my relationships, or my desire to be successful, you name it. Anything has the potential to become the object of your praise when you take your focus off of Christ. All right, I'm gonna need a little bit of participation. I want everyone to close your eyes and think about your own lives so far this semester. Has anything taken God's place as an object of your worship? I want you to think hard about this. Maybe you don't have to. But has anything taken the place of God being the object of your worship? And I want you to summarize that. Put it into one word. The object of my praise is blank. Now, I'm going to need some more participation because we're all going to say that phrase out loud with that thing that you were thinking of on the count of three. One, two, three. The object of my praise is my grades. Many of the things you probably just said are very valuable in the eyes of the world. They're probably things our culture holds in high esteem, but they ultimately are not praiseworthy. They're not worthy of our halal. Only God deserves that place of praise in our lives. 
So whatever it is that you said, let us take these things and put them at the foot of the cross and take up Christ as our sole object of our praise. The world may think of this as foolish or ridiculous, but let us remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God.